I'm Captain Kirk. Fascinating. Well, I'm a doctor, not a mechanic. Thank you, thank you. Love you. Mwah. Most illogical. I saw it. Well, that was different. Yep, rousy, but different. Places, please. And here we go. Welcome, ladies, gentlemen, bears, chickens, and things to episode 54 of the Muppet Trek podcast. I realized I didn't pick out an alien just now. You didn't. But That's go, okay. But go ahead, Steve. I'm Steve. Yeah. That guy's Jarman. <laughs> and we're here to compare, contrast, and confer about our two favorite franchises. Jarman, remind our audience what those are. See, those are both Muppets and Star Trek. That's why we usually reference an alien in the beginning of the episode. And we do one-to-one reviews of the Muppet Show and Star Trek, the original series. And this week, we have a doozy with special Muppet Show guest Pearl Bailey and the original series episode, The Ultimate Computer. <laughs> Absolutely. And we have to f- find out first, who is this uh, guest host, guest star, right? Not guest host. Guest, yeah. guest star. Guest star, because Kermit is the host. Nobody is hosting in his place. That's right. The guest star, Pearl Bailey. Who is this person, Steve? Uh, actress and singer who got her start in vaudeville before moving on to Broadway. She won a special Tony award in 1968 for the all black production of Hello, Dolly, in which she played the role of Dolly. Uh, what does our generation know her from? She passed away in 1990, so not too much. Uh, but our generation may know her as the voice of Big Mama in the Disney classic, The Fox and the Hound. OK, yeah, that's a pretty big one. But what the hell is she up to this week on The Muppet Show? Mm-hmm. Well, backstage this week, Floyd and the cast at first are not thrilled about performing the jousting scene from Camelot. There's a lot of build up to it. Later, Kermit finds out they can't afford to do it <laughs> and they have to change the entire f- closing number right at the last minute because they can't do the joust scene from Camelot <laughs> on stage this week. Uh, we start with an opening number. My soul is a witness. Pearl is backed by a Muppet gospel choir and it starts kind of somber and nice and then gets upbeat and rowdy. It's real good. After this, we have two chickens playing the bells of St. Marie on uh, some chimes before hitting a wrong note and collapsing the chimes. Next, we get a Muppet news flash. There's an explosion at a hat factory and you guessed it. The reporter is pummeled by hats. <laughs> Floyd visits Pearl's uh, dressing room complains further about his heavy metal costume and then they perform a really jazzy duet Thank good old summertime a lot of sexual tension there too yeah oh a lot yeah <laughs> uh following this we get to a repeat of high diddle dd with Fozzie and rolf it's a cute number but it's always sad to see a repeat yeah episode 301 apparently uh up next we get pigs in space lost in space the swine trek is bombarded with snack waves <laughs> turning everything into food piggy turns into a cake link turns into a head of cauliflower and the crew has started to eat the ship. We then get at the dance where the best joke this week is two snakes wondering if they're poisonous because one of them just bit their own tongue. Kermit reluctantly introduces sort of the jousting scene from Camelot. This leads to a jousting scene with a medley of other Broadway musical numbers, but none of them are from Camelot. (laughs) Kermit thanks Pearl Bailey. Floyd and Gonzo come out tangled in a mess of armor. Bailey says she can help and brandishes a welding torch. And that is what we call the Muppet show. That has to be one of the fastest rundowns you've ever given of a Muppet show episode before. Yeah. I mean, the backstage plot was very, very centered. Mm -hmm. And so because of that, I didn't have to, because normally there's like two competing backstage plots and things happen in different points of interest. Yeah. Right. Right. But in this one, there were a lot of longer musical numbers and that the Camelot, like the jousting scene at the end was like the whole last five minutes. It was very long. That's probably the longest maybe, number we've ever had. Yeah. Um, so, yeah, it was a short be- because they, the, the show was much chunkier this week. Mm. There weren't as many interludes, I think. I could see that. Uh, so, Jarman, what did you think of Pearl Bailey in this week's episode of The Muppet Show? Um, I think this is probably going to be my top 10. I'm putting it out there right now. Uh, I it, could absolutely see it. It's just, I I really, the name Pearl Bailey had rung a bell for me. I'm like, I know that name. And then I saw her face. And I'm like, I know that face, but I couldn't place where probably from my childhood somewhere. Um, Cause she's probably on a lot of different shows and a lot of different archival footage and that kind of thing. And um, 
so I was like, I had no idea going into this what was going to happen. And then the first number happens, and it's a it's a gospel number. I'm like, oh, is she like a gospel singer? This has been kind of boring. <laughs> so I was like, and it's like, oh, she's a good singer and everything. But oh, it's a little more upbeat. That's neat. And then from there, it just got better and better and better till we have this huge, massive, awesome number with costumes and medieval times and all these different songs from popular musicals we've all heard before, like. It was just like this just ended like on a huge note. It had a lot of our backstage plots, not backstage, but our little segments that we like with Bunsen Honeydew and uh, at the dance and Pigs in Space. And they somehow fit that all in with a good amount of Pearl Bailey, too. It was a good balance. Um, and she was just having a blast, it seemed. And she was so comfortable with the Muppets. It's almost like she was commanding the room and kind of like they were kind of her backup as it kind of should be. Um yeah, so it's like, what a solid, like, I wish if every episode of The Muppets was like this, it would just be off the charts. Like, it's just because it's so, it was so solid in what it's supposed to be, I feel like, when people think of The Muppet Show. Right. I think that Pearl Bailey is maybe one of the most malleable guests we've seen insofar as that she can act, she can play serious, she can sing multiple different styles of music successfully, mm -hmm. she can entertain, she can ham up a moment, and not every guest has all those pieces. Right. And so to see one that does... This puts me in like my book. This puts her on par with like the Zero Mostel yeah. episode where he had so many different facets. She had those same facets and we got to see all of them. Uh, additionally, we got to see the I don't know. There's not much improv in the Muppet show for obvious reasons, right. but her and Floyd's number in the good old summertime felt like maybe the closest to improv we've seen on the Muppet show so far. And it was really refreshing. Absolutely. Um, yeah, because I felt like he was saying things she wasn't expecting, but she was going right along with it. Oh, and they were playing against each other hard. It was great. And I have to say, in that number, she was getting saucy. And I was like, I'm attracted to this older black woman. <laughs> she That's just, <laughs> <laughs> she's Probably turning me like, on a bit. Bringing it, bringing it hard to the paint on the Muppet yeah, Show. She was, she was sexy as hell in that, that scene. Um, and I just, for some reason, just was so tickled by when the, um, Kermit's introducing or explaining to um you just said his name the 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 bass player or the guitar player um from the band uh Floyd Floyd, Floyd sorry Kermit. in the beginning Kermit's explaining to Floyd why he has to be in that armor suit of armor because he's the most honorable and that's why he picked him to have that part in the Camelot number because Floyd's complaining about the armor being terrible he's like man I want a heavy number not something like this or something like that but um yeah but then I was, he's like, oh, but then we have to have you with the, the, the black knight that will be revealed. We won't know who he is. And then Gonzo obviously comes in because the, the mask he's is made. a big hook nose. Big giant hook <laughs> nose. And for, I know it's such an easy joke, but it was just so silly. It made me, it tickled me to no end. I don't know why that was and so they funny. they played the same joke with uh, when Gonzo played Darth Vader on a pigs in space not long ago because he comes in face forward and you can't see. And then he turns sideways and you immediately know. <laughs> the giant is. nose. <laughs> um, and then the joust number at the end, so many puppets, multiple different scenes, like six musical number crammed into one. And it was so much going on. Right. And the numbers kind of fit until it gets to like piggies and they're kind of stretching a bit. And I thought it was funny. And then all of a sudden Pearl Bailey turns to uh, Rolf and she's like, this doesn't make any sense, does it? He's like, nope. <laughs> so that was great. <laughs> they called it. Um, uh, and I also I call out a uh, kind of a Star Trek uh, connection thing, but I, it's mm -hmm. not big enough for the segment later on. Right. But, um, often they'll talk about the cabbage head. In in Star Trek podcasts, I hear people talking about that a lot and in genre shows in general where it's the cabbage head is the character who the audience identifies with. It's the person who was always asking the questions like the captain will say, we need to go to a class four nebula and you'll have somebody say, what the hell is a class four nebula? And they're called the cabbage head because they're representing you. I'm not sure why it's called cabbage head. <laughs> so then when he okay. said when she piggy looks at him and says, you you have a cabbage head. I was like, oh, are they referencing that? I wasn't sure, but it was like, because I think it's used in sci fi a lot to so have a person in the show, like Lost in Space, who's the dumb guy who can ask the questions, you know? But in this case, he was an actual cabbage head. Yeah, and he's he's also the dumb guy in the ship. So it kind of actually made sense. It was just a good little in joke there. It was kind of neat. Um, but yeah, I think between a few staples, a great solid single backstage plot, not multiple backstage plots, one, a great multifaceted uh, musical guest. And then a great closing number. This you're absolutely right. This is top ten easily. And I think easily. we're finding out that they do very well with guests who are very inclined to musical theater, because that's the skills you kind of need for this show. And so that's why comedians who just are kind of a one trick pony comedian don't do very well. Um, it's just like Zero Mostel is another example. Yeah, of Zero that. Mostel. Yeah. So it's like if Zero Mostel and her were like on the show together, it'd be a blast. Just amazing. Yeah. yeah. Amazing. So 
There you go. And Jarman would be doubly turned on. <laughs> Zero must tell. Give me your big beard. <laughs> uh, well, this week, the music, uh, My Soul is a Witness, music by Billy Preston, who was a session keyboardist for folks like Little Richard, Ray Charles, The Beatles. And the lyrics were by a guy named Joe Green, uh, who was a male soprano. Oh, who did vocals on albums for people like Quincy Jones, Neil Diamond, and Ringo Starr. Interesting. The Bells of St. Mary, this song has become synonymous with Christmas, despite the fact that there is no direct mention of the holiday. Uh, it was used in a 1945 movie of the same title during a Christmas pageant scene, and then the Drifters released it as a B-side on their recording of White Christmas that became famous, and so it just got locked in as a Christmas song. Weird. Weird. Despite the fact that nothing really makes it a Christmas song. <laughs> Uh, in the good old summertime, written in the early 1900s, publishers uh, originally didn't want to put it out uh, because they were afraid that people would lose interest in the song when it wasn't summertime. <laughs> That's interesting. Uh, so now we're into the big medley. Uh, Ascot, I can't say, Ascot Gavo from My Fair Lady. It's the opening number about the, the horse race mm -hmm. uh, by Lerner and Lowe. Frederick Lerner was addicted to drugs for nearly 20 <laughs> years. He was a patient of uh, a guy by the name of Max Goodman, who better known as Do uh, Dr. Feelgood. Oh, who gave him, quote unquote, vitamin shots that were really amphetamines. <laughs> <laughs> this will make you feel great. <laughs> uh, Hello, Dolly from musical by the same name. The original Dolly on Broadway was Carol Channing, who will later also be a Muppet Show guest. And Stephen Jarman connection. We were both in that production in high school. That's right. I played the the lead older guy. And I played the Rudolph. At, the at uh, sixteen. Mater D. Yeah, you had the. You always played the old age makeup. <laughs> well, yeah. When you're like six feet tall and have a gruff voice, that is just your lot in the high school theater. Absolutely. Uh, Fugue for Tin Horns from Guys and Dolls. It was selected uh, to win the Pulitzer Prize in 1950. However, Abe Burroughs was blacklisted during the Red Scare by the House on American Activities Committee mm. and Columbia University just said, no, nah, we're not giving out that prize this year. Oh, that's crazy. Uh, anything you can do from Annie Get Your Gun by Irving Berlin. He died at age 101. <sighs> and wow. the day after his death, the lights of Broadway marquees all over the city were dimmed in his honor. Hmm. Uh, a boy like that from West Side Story uh, with music by Leonard Bernstein. Bernstein was a prolific conductor who had a really turbulent engagement to an actress who he married basically just to dispel the rumors that he was gay. <laughs> <laughs> That's really funny uh, because the boards of these huge orchestras were all super conservative. And so he was afraid he was going to get blacklisted, basically. Yeah, I should but say that's funny. That's that's really sad. But yeah, <laughs> year <laughs> later through books by his widow and a Japanese lover he had who was like Ooh. an insurance salesman or something. <laughs> cool. <laughs> who They had a long time, long distance affair. Wow. With this, this Japanese gentleman. Uh, Everything's Coming Up Roses, originally from Gypsy, um, performed on Broadway by Ethel Merman, and who is also a fellow Muppet Show guest. I think she might have sang that part of that song. When I she, think she did. Right she did towards the, at the end. Yeah. yeah, at the end. So, Jarman, what did you think was the best Muppeteering moment this weekend? I this, don't know if, this episode. If we can go against that just whole last number. I mean, Jesus. That's yeah, the whole the, joust scene it gets my vote. It's the biggest thing we've seen on this show so far. The biggest production wise, like everyone's there. Everyone's in a costume. Um, there's movement. There's horses. There's different levels. There's it's insane. <laughs> like yeah, between the, the amount of puppets, the horse riding, the different scenes within it. It's just a spectacle of Muppet performance. Yeah, you can tell some budget was involved. <laughs> yes, <laughs> absolutely. Uh, so, German, tell us about this week's episode of the original series that we watched. Well, now we have the ultimate computer, and I bet some of our audience might know where this is going to go as far as the way Kirk likes to handle computers, but not <laughs> to spoil anything. So the Enterprise is summoned to a nearby space station by Starfleet with no explanation given, and they find out from Commodore Wesley, which is Gene Roddenberry's middle name. That's why he's Commodore Wesley. OK, that okay. the Enterprise is going to be the guinea pig for a new computer AI called the M5 Multitronic System. And I'll never say that again in this summary. Uh, it's a computer designed by the famous Dr. Richard Daystrom that will supposedly be able to take over all the functions of starships with no need for a crew. 
So Commodore Wesley says that it will be installed on the Enterprise as kind of the guinea pig and have a minimal crew, about 20 people, and be tested out in some war games. And Dr. Daystrom himself will remain on board to oversee the project. At first, it seems that the computer is working perfectly and everything's going fine. But then it starts doing some unexpected things like turning off power to the parts of the ship that are now unoccupied and then also draining more power than the ship than it was expected. But for unknown reasons. But Dr. Daystrom's like, it's all normal. It's fine. It's totally fine. Um, that's how we talked. The Commodore comes back to, to, with um, the Commodore comes back with two ships to do a mock attack. Um, and the computer successfully play fights them off with some minimal phasers, you know, like the war games are supposed to go, but with some excellent maneuvering to make it happen. The Commodore then jokes afterwards in the view screen, calling Kirk Captain Dunsel, which is apparently a slang term in Starfleet for being an unnecessary part of the ship. It makes Kirk very upset and he goes drinks with bones for a while. Then the Enterprise encounters an unmanned freighter with nobody on it, and the computer immediately attacks and destroys it for no reason. Uh, Kirk is obviously pissed, so he orders the computer to be shut down. So they go to engineering to do so under protest by Dr. Daystrom. But when they try to approach the computer, it suddenly has a, a force field surrounding it and knocks them all back. So Scotty orders a random redshirt engineer to disconnect the computer's direct connection to the warp engines. But when he tries to do it, he's vaporized by a beam from the computer. So now they have a dead guy in their hands. So Spock and Scotty try to do a manual override up in the Jeffries tubes, but the supercomputer has already rerouted all of its controls somewhere else in the ship. So Spock then tries to get more information from Daystrom about this computer, and Daystrom reveals that the computer was imprinted with his human engrams. So we would guess that means his brain and personality, that kind of thing. So now the computer is basically a human mind, both the computing power of a supercomputer. So it's growing and changing and trying to protect itself. So suddenly another mock war game commences, this time with four Federation ships. Uh, and McKirk is unable to warn the incoming ships that the computer is out of control because the computer has shut off all communications, of course. So the computer-controlled Enterprise quickly kills 53 people on board one of the ships with an attack and then kills all the people on another ship. So the other two ships just cut and run and get out of there and report back to Starfleet that Kirk has apparently gone mad and is attacking his own people. So Starfleet then gives the command to the Commodore to destroy the Enterprise so it doesn't kill anybody else. So Daystrom, Dr. Daystrom, then convinces the crew that he might be able to communicate directly with the computer since it has his own brainwaves and engrams, and he could possibly convince it to stop killing. But after talking to the computer for a bit, Daystrom has a psychotic break and just makes everything worse. So Spock nerve pinches him and gets him out of the way. And then Kirk takes over, trying to reason with the computer system. Uh, here we go. And we all know what happens when Kirk talks to computers. Kirk asks the computer what its purpose is, and it responds that it is to protect lives. And Kirk then informs the computer of the obvious, that he just murdered a whole bunch of people. <laughs> so the computer acknowledges this. So Kirk then asks the computer what the penalty of murder is, and the computer answers death, which is kind of surprising to find out the Federation still has the death penalty. That's a little disturbing. Uh, so the computer shuts itself down and in doing so cripples the Enterprise. Um, and Spock comes to the conclusion that the computer wants to commit suicide as a punishment for its actions by letting the oncoming Star Starfleet ships just come and destroy the Enterprise. But since the computer is now shut down, Scotty can start to get command of some of the ship's functions. And Kirk wants to tell the oncoming ships not to fire, but Scotty can't get communications back up in time. So Kirk takes a gamble and tells Scotty to just shut down the ship entirely so it looks like it's dead in the water and no threat. And luckily, the oncoming Commodore Wesley doesn't think this is a trap and commands the ships not to fire. The gamble pays off and they eventually get things back to normal. And Dr. Daystrom is left sedated and in need of professional help. And that is the ultimate computer. So, Steve, what did you think of this episode? Uh, so some things I liked. Uh, great indirect villain. Anytime there's a villain without a face that they really pull off. Hmm. I think it's a good job. And the fact that Daystrom wasn't the villain, but he was a reflection of the thing he had built. Yeah, I think was a, a good way to handle it. Um, good setup. Daystrom's acting, despite a few big over the top moments, was maybe some of the best guest star acting. Yeah, we've seen on the show the mix of pride and regret. Um, and the crew's technical efforts to thwart it all felt very Star Trek. -y. Like they weren't over the top or insane the way some episodes go. It was very techy. Yeah. 
some things I dislike. God damn it, Kirk tricked another <laughs> computer. And I was really hoping it wasn't going to go that way. Right. I was so hopeful it wasn't going to go that way. Uh, another thing I disliked was there was just wasn't enough explanation or suspension of disbelief. We're like, they gave Kirk this assignment. We're going to let a computer, an experimental computer, control most of your ship, and we're going to do war games with it. And then it started killing people, and they're like, Kirk's gone mad. <laughs> yeah. Well, not the computer. It must be yeah, Kirk. Nobody, but nobody was like, oh, that's right. We put this experimental computer in charge of the ship. Oh, right. That's that true. Just, that just felt dumb. I think if the, it could have been explained to it, like, if Wesley was the only one that knew it, it was a top secret mission, Kirk. Only me and a few other people are aware. And then his ship was the one that was destroyed. Ah, uh, yeah. That would have been an easy way out. The only guy that knows this thing is on this ship is gone. So everyone does assume Kirk has gone mad. So there just wasn't enough explanation to make that suspension of disbelief happen for me. Also for me, and that same suspension of disbelief thing is that the computer is programmed not to kill and to protect Starfleet, but immediately kills in Starfleet. So I'm like, it didn't really explain well enough why it thought it had to do that. And it, and it, yeah, there there was a little bit at the end with uh, Kirk, I think, where it was like, uh, "I must kill to you must you kill to defend yourself." Like I was like, "Okay, okay I get, I guess." <laughs> and it's like it knows what Starfleet is, and its one directive is not is to help Starfleet. So it, you would know that that should be above everything, including protecting yourself. So I just didn't really quite click, but I mean. It, it, it's, it was feel like one of those rushed endings again that they could have done a little better with. Um, well, and, and I feel like they were onto a good idea. Right. And someone in the writer's room grabbed the wheel and made, and pulled it hard to the left in that like Daystrom was talking down the computer and it was a reflection of himself and he was self he, like he was it, becoming introspective and that was all great. And someone went, oh, crap, Kirk's got to be the hero. Right. And they're like, uh, OK, how do we get Daystrom out of there as fast as possible? OK, we'll have him go nuts. <laughs> and then Spock has to nerve pinch him, and then Kirk will trick the computer with words, I and guess. And saves the day. So it's just one of those things where I was like, they had to make Kirk the hero. They had to make Kirk the hero to the detriment of the actual story. I agree with that. But, like, it could have been even better in that, like, they could have made Kirk the hero if the computer system, M5, was modeled after him. Uh, one of the most successful Starfleet captains. That would make a lot of, of sense. Of all time. Right, but better than him. Mm. Like that would they would have dug the point even further and been in the same vein with very little adjustments. But once again, they just missed the mark. And then how does he argue himself um, out of living? Right. Yeah. Like that would have been genius. And it would have made the him becoming the obsolete part even more palpable. Because but it's it, modeled it after him. me. It's it's right. Because it would. <laughs> so I just think it was a missed opportunity in that regard. So there might be an ongoing segment that I might be a little late on that I thought we could even go forward just noticing this going forward is that mm. right after the show ended uh fan fiction became a huge thing even starting at season two and some of the big things even back in the late 60s was fan fiction of shipping spock and kirk and now of course it's a huge thing of them being an item or having subtle moments that they saw on the show and they thought it was a real thing and put it in their books like these fan fictions right. um and there was a big moment in this one that stuck out to me it was a bro love moment when spock looks directly at Kirk lovingly and says, I mean, the computer is very fascinating, but I'll never serve under computer. And he stares at him longingly. And then Kirk looks back wow. at him. And it's okay, just like, so <laughs> we're going to go with like Star Trek bro love. We'll bro work on the title. Yeah. Some bro love moments when we see those stick out, especially between Kirk and Spock. I, it's, it's the thing that goes on. And later on, we get D space nine. We'll have another bro love couple there, but that's like another. starstruck starstruck. We'll, oh. we'll work on it. We'll yeah. Work yeah on we'll figure it, it out. We'll but yeah, workshop it. So we got some trivia for this episode. Um, it's actually some fascinating stuff here. So the Daystrom Institute uh, mentioned is mentioned prominently prominently in Star Trek Next Generation, Deep Space Nine and Voyager and even in Star Trek Picard, which is brand new. And it's named after this doctor, Dr. Richard Daystrom, um, which is interesting that he must he must get better and do better work after he went nuts. Otherwise, they wouldn't name everything after him. So that's pretty cool. Um. In addition to playing his regular role of Scotty in this episode, James Doohan is also the voice of the M5, that computer voice. And also, it's pretty evident at the end, he was the voice of the Commodore on the radio 
Um, cause he, for some reason did that Commodore with also like a Scottish or Irish accent. I couldn't tell. It was weird. Mm-hmm. It's like, but he is, he's Canadian. So I don't know why he just didn't do a different voice for that. It was, it was strange, but yeah, he did two voices in this episode. And this is a fun double shout out also to Sean Vanderloo, because this is from his favorite author, Robert J. Sawyer, who was on the IMDb trivia page this episode. Um, in his 1999 essay, welcome aboard the enterprise science fiction author, Robert J. Sawyer writes uh the ship's computers the ship's computers as seen in the ultimate computer were designed by a nobel prize winning black cyberneticist played by with equal dignity by william marshall during the era of martin luther king and the watts riots it was a powerful important statement to have the white captain of the enterprise deferring to black people as marshall observed 30 years later the single most significant thing about his guest starring role was that he an african american was referred to as sir throughout the episode this was pretty groundbreaking at the time um, and that guy was huge. That actor, too. He's just a big guy. <laughs> you see him yeah. dwarfing Kirk. Definitely this... c- commanded the uh, commanded the shots he was in. Oh, yeah. I wish they could have had like a big brawl because he would have kicked his ass. But yeah, and R- yeah. Robert J. Sawyer, that guy who made that quote, was on Sean's podcast. The Russ's Robot actually is a guest. So it's pretty cool. That's crazy. Yeah. And this episode was a social commentary on the American job losses caused by increased mechanization during the 1960s, which still remains a problem to this day. Uh, that was one of Andrew Yang, one of our presidential candidates from the last uh, election, was running basically on how we're going to be all mechanized out of our jobs soon. So we'll need an international inc- or a what do you call it? Uh, a universal income. universal income. So, yeah, it's still to this day becoming more and more problem. We seem to kind of, you know, shape and evolve our societies around that problem. But, yeah, this is what that was based off of. Uh, Kirk recites John Maysfield's poem, Sea Fever. All I ask is a tall ship, that whole poem. And he recites it again in The Final Frontier. And then Cork mm. Cork paraphrases it in Deep Space Nine, Little Green Men episode, which is pretty cool. And it appears on the USS Defiance dedication plaque later on in Deep Space Nine as well. Uh, Spock mentions that there's nothing in the 23rd century computer technology to replace a starship's medical officer. But we have in Star Trek Voyager, 100 years later, a medical officer who is a hologram. So it's pretty funny that he mentions <laughs> that. And this is also the fourth time that Kirk talks a computer to death. He did it in The Changeling, which we covered, The, the Return of the Archons, and I Mud. All three of those episodes we've already seen. So I don't know if I mean, we have any more of those, but we'll see if there's more of him killing. Oh, there's got to be more. <laughs> we have a whole season left. That's true. So what are our Trek connection Muppet connections this week, Steve? Oh, boy. Well, to start us off, we haven't had one in a while. Pearl Bailey appeared on an episode of The Love Boat. Yeah. And as we've talked about before, many, many other Muppet Show guests, as well as Star Trek supporting actors, were also on The Love Boat. Mm, Yeah. Uh, In 1990, Nichelle Nichols performed a one woman show called Reflections, in which she impersonated and honored other female singers, including Ella Fitzgerald, Lena Horne and Pearl Bailey. Nice. And we had a Lena Horn episode already. So there you go. Uh, William Marshall, who played Richard Daystrom, uh, was the king of cartoons on Pee Wee's Playhouse. Hmm. One of the special effects department workers was a guy by the name of Sal DeNaro, who also worked in the art department on The Muppet Show. Oh, well, what do you know? And William Marshall also played the title role of Blackula, which released in August of 1972. Another famous fictitious vampire debuted just months later in October, uh, November 1972, Count Von Count in Sesame Street. Oh, look at that. What a connection. That's right. <laughs> uh, German, these were basically the same episode, right? Oh, completely. I mean, there was the same thing. Look, look at this. Gonzo's trumpet plays without him in the beginning, just as the Enterprise was controlled without its crew. <laughs> I mean, the same thing. I love it. I love it. <laughs> Both feature broken expectations. Floyd wanted to play something heavy and ends up in armor. And the Enterprise wants to test the M5 and ends up killing people. (laughs) Uh, Just like how Statler and Waldorf turn over their critiquing their critiquing job to an avocado. Just like the Enterprise crew turns over their duties to a computer. (laughs) Uh, Both feature surprising benefits, followed by terrible consequences. Beaker, I forgot to even talk about this sketch. Beaker uh, likes eating the edible paper clips only to have his nose fall off. <laughs> Kirk and the crew are initially impressed with the performance of the N5, which then murders people. I had that one as well, that Honeydew makes an invention that does not go as planned, just as Dr. Daystrom yep, does. There we yeah. go. There we go. 
Uh, Kermit is very excited to create the Camelot number, but when he needs to shut it down, his creation has outgrown him, and the Black Knight Gonzo won't allow him to shut it down, just as Dr. Daystrom gives life to the supercomputer, but it outgrows his own power and won't uh, let okay. him shut it down. They both have a life of their own. Yeah, that was, like it. it was a long walk, but I got there. Uh, both feature a head-to-head battle, the Jousters and the Enterprise with the other ships. There you go. <laughs> oh, what's that noise? Transporter malfunction. Transporter malfunction. Okay, it's the time of the show where we transport two characters from one episode to the other and vice versa. What do you got for us, Steve? Well, this week, Trek to Muppets, I've got Daystrom coming over to replace Floyd. Uh, I was meant to be something greater. I wanted to play heavy metal music. Now look at me. The other's always jeering behind my back. I just think it would add a huge (laughs) overblown note of aplomb. That'd be wonderful. And further sexed up that number with Pearl Bailey. Oh, yeah. In the dressing room, they would just be going at it. Uh, Pearl Bailey could transport over to be Dr. Daystrom because she could sweet talk that computer to do anything she wanted. Unlike Daystrom, who just loses his cool. Mm -hmm. Uh, Muppets and Shrek, I've got having Strangeport come over to replace Daystrom. And instead of certain doom, it's just replaced by silliness and failure. (laughs) And him just eating. (laughs) Yeah. Uh, Dr. Daystrom would come over to take the place of Dr. Bunsen Honeydew permanently for the rest of the show. Just forever. Because <laughs> it would cut to his sketches. This is, this is a long walk, too. It cuts to his sketches in his lab, and things would get dark really quick. He takes everything very seriously with wild eyes. And Beaker is more and more maimed every episode and terrified of his life before him, but is forever trapped to Daystrom's whims. <laughs> Beaker, eat these paper clips. They are my life's work. <laughs> You always laughed at me. <laughs> I am the computer. You gotta watch this episode, folks. It's fun. Yeah, that's great. So that brings us to the end of episode 54 of the Muppet Trek podcast. That's right. Join us next time for the Muppet Show with special guest Gene Stapleton. An original series episode, Bread and Circuses. <laughs> so from the lovers, the dreamers, and us. Live long and prosper, everyone. Thanks for listening to the Muppet Trek Podcast. Be sure to follow us on social media on Facebook and Twitter. Subscribe to us on Apple Podcasts, YouTube, Spotify, or your favorite podcast platform. This podcast has been brought to you by A Play on Nerds. 